I want to uh, introduce our speaker for today. This is a really exciting. I've known Chris myself personally for almost 20 years, so I have many great stories to tell. And I knew when he made the decision to come here and be part of Citrus that he would flourish and create a great amount of energy, not only as a leader and as a lab manager and the senior inventioneer in the invention lab, uh, but also he teaches a number of tremendous courses here at Berkeley, has a lot of touch with students, and I think I've seen personally how he's inspired them to do really fantastic work. Chris comes from a really interesting background. Uh, it's something I'm very excited about. He went to Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. He worked on automobiles and electric vehicles, medical equipment, wearables, many different things, including uh, toys. He went on to work at Wild Planet, which is a toy company. Many of you probably grew up on some of these toys that Chris influenced you, and now you're at Berkeley, so you can say, yes, I was inspired by that. He's worked at Intel Research, he's worked and collaborated with folks at Xerox Park, Nokia Research, and as I said, he also has his own projects that he's passionate about, and I really appreciate not only his leadership and mentorship in the Invention Lab, but also the way that he has had tremendous outreach and bringing in uh, lots of uh, other youth and women and others to computing and making, and I think he's probably inspired many of us in this room. And it's an honor to introduce him. So let's welcome Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, wow, what an introduction. I like that guy you were talking about. Um, OK, so uh, welcome. And um, how's your lunch? You don't have to answer if your mouth's full. That's fine. That's, uh, yeah. uh, that was a great, I was going to talk about myself. Uh, um, so, uh, Invention Lab downstairs in the basement. If you haven't been, I, sorry, downstairs, first floor. It's the Satarjadai Hall. It's too nice. It's too nice to be called a basement. Um, uh, if you haven't been there, be sure to check it out sometime. We're always welcoming people for you know. You can just drop by for a tour, ask us what's going on, see things. Um, so please, uh, I'm an educator, and well, that's what I call myself, and I'm not sure. Uh, why? Um, but I've been teaching ever since uh, um, I graduated high school. I didn't go straight into college. Um, it was kind of a, well, that's a different story. But uh, I taught at a local museum, Palo Alto Junior Museum, uh, which is a wonderful place, um, and taught a lot of after school classes for young kids. And it was there that I learned two things, um, that I am good with kids, <laughs> and, um, and I know a lot of stuff. And I was able to try to teach that to very, very young minds, and which aren't too different from undergrads, but in, the, in, the, uh, in, a, in a lot of different ways. Um, but uh, it was there. I started learning, you know, I was very uh, passionate about learning. I was, uh, if the subject inter uh, interests me, I was on it. And if the subject didn't inter interest me, I would be, that's the back burner class. And so I had grades all over the place, and, um, uh, which was very interesting uh, for my parent, to my parents. Um, uh, in school, I also, uh, once I did finally start college, uh, I did the same thing. There was a local museum. I did the classes. Uh, that was a little bit. There was uh, that was a great program. I got to design the courses, and 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 teach them. That was a lot of fun, and I actually continued this uh, when I gra after graduation moved up to San Francisco. Worked for a wonderful toy company, and uh, there was a place in San Francisco called the Artery. It was an art studio, so I was able to take those classes and kind of make them into art classes. Um, and what was wonderful uh, was I did get a job at a, another university teaching product design. And I had a class called Material and Processes. And in that class, you learn how to make things with factories. So what does it take to design? What are the design considerations to make things with big machines and make lots of them? Um, well, that was a lecture type class, kind of like this, maybe half the size of the room. Theater seating, um, slanted floor, nice projection, and 
we'd go through lots of videos, a lot of how-to information, a big fat textbook or several of them. And it's, you know, I turn on the lights at the end of the lecture and invariably there was someone sleeping. And, um, and once, one student, he wore in some of my wearable tech toys that he had as a kid. He had gone home and grabbed them on the break, was wearing them to class, thought it was very funny. And I turn on the lights and he's sleeping. <laughs> if I can't even keep him awake, what am I doing? How, you know, I was very worried about the um, students in the back row. You know, they were always the ones that were just, you know, are they passing or not? You know, how are they? And I knew some of them from other classes and I'm like, what are, you know, what's going on here? And um, unlike me, I'd be in the front row, you know, sponge, like, oh, I want to learn how to do this. I need to know how to do this. Um, and I had a pretty good memory back then, too. Um, so I started thinking about the classes I was teaching in the muse that I taught in the museums, uh, and that I was currently t teaching at the artery. And um, and these classes, we would um, we would take uh, uh, we would take uh, apart things, get parts, get raw materials, go to the craft bin, pull in raw materials, and start creating things. So I started thinking about uh, what is education? Um, is it a transfer of knowledge? Um, uh, how, and how do we transfer that knowledge? Uh, you know, in my high school and college, there was a lot of textbooks, a lot of listening, a lot of tests, and um, uh, luckily in product design, there was a lot of doing also. Um, but uh, it's this lecture learn mode, which really opened the gap between uh, in the learning. Um, uh, the learning, uh, the transfer of knowledge, is it uh, discovery? Um, you know, how do you learn? And through discovery is a, is a great way to do it. Um, let's see, back up a second. Uh, teaching material processes, artery. And then an amazing thing happened. There was the first Maker Faire. This was back in 2005, 2006. I went to Maker Faire, I was blown away. Who's been to Maker Faire? Okay, then you know. It's this amazing group of people from all over the United States and the world come to show off the things they've made, technology projects. There's technology companies there showing off their latest and greatest. So it's an amazing blend of, of, of these two groups. And it's just huge. I was blown away. And um, uh, I decided like, oh, I need to be a part of this. And so I, I, I took what I was teaching in the, in the artery class, uh, which I called Artbots. Um, and in that class, we were taking apart things and learning how things worked getting the motors out and you know, the kids were discovering, you know, what's making this move? Oh, this little uh, cylinder. Uh, what happens when we connect it to a battery? Oh, it spins. And more importantly, there'd be, oh, what happens when I put two batteries on it? What happens when I, I, I found a kid like trying to put six batteries on this little tiny mirror, motor and I'm like, okay, fine, let's put on the safety glasses first. And of course it's like spun like and then, uh, but then you're like, what's that smell? And so there's a lot of, um, <laughs> but it was learning. It was like, okay, what is overvolting? What is, you know, what's the resistance of the wire? Why is it getting hot? Um, and the kids, that class, you know, was packed. There's always a waiting list for it. And um, at the same time, there was uh, some younger kids would come into the class and um, it was hard for some of the students to imagine, oh, you know, this hairdryer we took apart it's a hair dryer. They couldn't see these forms as other things. Um, so I started laser cutting parts. Um, up until that time, we had been um, up. Well, we had been taking uh, pieces and just gluing them together, uh, using zip ties where we could to hold things together. Because that's the hardest thing to do is how do you hold things together? Um, when I was a kid, it was tape, duct tape, masking tape, um, uh, glue, and glue would take forever to to dry or harden, um, tape would always come off or get really sticky. So um, zip ties made it. Oops, zip ties made it much faster. Um, uh, wow, I'm dating. I just realized that this is a cassette player <laughs> that we took apart. That was a while back. Um, uh, and and so uh, uh, we went from uh, just zip tying things to, to, together and. Um, taping things together and using a piece of wood to mount everything to. Uh, I started laser cutting uh, little pieces for the uh, younger students to be able to zip tie easily. And these pieces were more 
abstract. It wasn't a hair dryer they're putting together. Um, it was just uh, they could imagine it. They could construct uh, construct something to their own imagination. Um, and um, there's some of the um, these here are, uh, little uh, robots we made out of mice. Um, these are robots, battle bots, of course. Uh, you know what is it? You know young boys, if it moves, they want to run it together, um, uh, make a make them battle a race or something. Um, uh, the, the, the girls in the class wanted it to do something else. And so there was a lot of kinetic movement, a little kinetic sculptures, and then we started doing drawing robots. And that was a big hit. Um, and that's what I took to, to Maker Faire, is these drawing robots. And you know, it was basically a kit of laser cut parts. I was laser cutting these on my own. And there was many more parts. This was a very basic kit here. Uh, there's more parts than that. There was usually a pile of parts on the uh, middle of the table. They would have a basic, you know, enough to get started, and then they could pull pieces off. Um, uh, there was, uh, these could go together in many different ways. There's no one way to do it. And um, that was another learning experience is uh, around the tables at Maker Faire, they'd be looking at each other to see what the, how to do it correctly. And, um, and I'd always try to point out the ones, oh my goodness, how young was I there? Jeez, I used to be good looking. Oh my God. Um, uh, uh, we'd have plenty of zip ties, uh, but this was, I think I was, uh, I was charging for this little workshop $10. I wanted to make sure all the kids had something to do. Because there was a lot of activities there, but mostly older and more dangerous stuff. Uh, you usually have to sign a safety waiver <clears throat> to do anything. And this little girl was walking around, picking all the, going through the piles, picking all the, white ones and all the black ones. And she was getting big handfuls of it and I was like counting those. I'm like, oh, five cents, 10 cents, 15, 20. Oh my goodness, um, that's costing me a lot of money. And, um, and then, uh, but I was too busy to stop her and thank goodness because this is what she came up with. She just covered her whole spin bot with these. And when it moved, it was amazing. It was like the sea anemone. It was, it was beautiful and of, um, uh, that was, uh, there was two points that, it was very inspiring to me to see what she came up with and also helped me remember like, just let it go. There's, uh, you know, uh, you can guide, you can guide them, but don't, you know, let them explore, do not. And I was putting on these, I thought pretty wide boundaries, um, but those were a little bit too close in, um, uh, looking back on it. Um, and so these classes were, uh, these art shop, these uh, art bot workshops that, um, um, at Maker Fair were incredibly successful. There were, we had more people than we could ever, we could ever um, uh, manage. And um, uh, they're just the, uh, they're also successful in the, how it got the kids into making, creating. A lot of times this was the first thing that the kids had built. You know, the kids were used to using materials for art classes and stuff, but being, you know, um, today we're locked into our screen devices and stuff and our electronic toys. And so this is a, a lot of times the first thing they'd constructed from parts where they were the author of it and it actually did something. Um, and um, so it, was, uh, uh, it, it allowed the kids to be creative. And another thing is uh, every class, every workshop session, we'd have several adults in the class. And I'd ask and you know, I would expect teachers. And there was uh, several teachers who would take the, the workshop to learn how to um, do this and you know, take it back to the school. But then there was a lot of non-teachers and I would ask, why are you doing this? And they're like, uh, it looked like a lot of fun. And so here's the, the, um, here's the, the adults coming in saying, I don't know anything about a circuit. I don't know how uh, electricity works. And they would take the class and learn how to connect a battery to a motor, to a switch and make it do something. Um, and that was completely surprising. Um, uh, uh, and you can see from some of these pictures, I'm gonna go ahead here, and uh, you, I would I try to take some exit pictures of kids and their faces um, um, of the, 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 the pride they had in constructing these was unbelievable. Oh, let's, I'm going too far ahead. Um, the pride in building these was, uh, was unbelievable. And that was surprising to me. I hadn't make, made all those connections yet. Um, so I took this information back to my 
boring materials and process class and got rid of the quizzes, got rid of the midterm and the exams and made it all project based. And um, the first project was deconstructing a product and identifying all the parts, what they did and their materials and the process used to make that part. Um, so it could be, you know, ABS plastic and it could be injection molded or it could be, you know, a, a, a ferrous metal, it could be stamped or cast. Um, so they had to label all these pieces. Um, and that was the, the learning part. Um, uh, uh, but the difficult part is they had to make these into a display, um, either like an exploded view or a cutaway section view of it. And it had to be in a manner that an observer could look at it and, and put it back together, understand how it came apart, how it went back together. And um, the product design students had a lot of experience giving, you know, shaping things and giving form and putting together prototypes. Um, uh, but now, uh, so they were into this hands-on project. And um, the last constraint was it had to be museum quality. And that's a whole different thing. Um, that played into the explanation of the relationship of the parts with each other. Um, but the museum quality took it to another level of, um, uh, one, it was a way to teach craft, which is really hard to do. You know, why does it matter if things are even or clean or, you know, how does that affect the design or the presentation? Um, and, um, but that was the only constraint. And I let them pick their own products. They didn't have, I didn't have a set of things they could, uh, I asked to, you know, be informed, so I knew, and that was more to keep them from doing something too complex as opposed to too easy. Um, but I did have a guy, uh, he was one of the uh, students sitting in the back row, and he's like, I need to get my project approved. I'm like, sure, what is it? And he pulls out a big pen. And I'm like, and he thought that was really funny. And I'm like, sure, but, you know, remember what you have to do, and, uh, and it better be a you know, museum quality display. And um, he came out with a, one of the best in the class. It was, um, these were wall mounted, making it harder to, to do than just a pedestal or floor mount. And he had this big arc of like white, matte white wire and the different pin elements suspended on it. And he had these call outs off the wall um, with little threads going, but it was all, it was museum quality. And it was all, um, you walked in the room and you wanted to know what it was because it was, it was that um, uh, captivating and it was, uh, it was, it was beautiful. Um, and uh, so he succeeded um, very well on that project. But it was, it was giving these uh, hands-on projects that allowed them to, um, to actually uh, interact with the materials outside of the textbook, out off of the quiz page, that they were able to get a much better understanding of what the materials were and what the processes, what were the complexity of shapes that each process allowed. Um, another project is we did a materials, um, um, table of elements almost, uh, like a materials uh, wall, and we decided on a tile size, and that was it. Uh, the students could actually come up with the design and the organization themselves. And it was a wonderful materials wall in the back of the classroom uh, where they would have these different material samples with the parts on the wall, you know, what they're, what's the complexity of the part that was um, uh, uh, able to be created in that material. So that was wonderful, and they was all self-organized and stuff, and they took a lot of pride in that. Um, um, I would even come in the room, and other students outside of the class were using it as a aid, as a learning aid for their projects. Um, and um, there was a process chart they, um, uh, that was fully a student-led project where they had to map out the processes, the manufacturing processes on the wall. And they did something that looked like this big conspiracy theory with this yarn going everywhere from photos to samples and stuff. It was a huge mess. But you walked in, you're like, what is, you were drawn into it. And it actually worked. You could follow it through, oh, this process is related to this one, which is related, and this is based on this one. And it was great. And um, so I, to turn the lecture room into this almost like a learning environment where you didn't have to have slides or notes up. They, you know, students could interact with the environment. Um, which is wonderful, um, and that really, uh, that really transformed that class, and one, made teaching much easier for me, and um, I didn't have as many tests to grade, I didn't have to try to motivate the, you know, you know, why aren't you learning, why aren't you, you need this information, you know, you're going to get a job, 
then you'll need this. It will always kill me when the students would sell their textbook to another student, you know, taking, they're done with the class, so here. So I'm like, no, you're going to need that the rest of your career. Don't do that. And um, the price is going to go up when you need it. Um, um, but now, fast forward to the Invention Lab. And Invention Lab is uh, amazing because it's open to the whole UC Berkeley community. So we get all different people in, from undergrads to graduates, as faculty, as staff, um, visiting researchers. Um, it's an amazing place. And uh, uh, it's that variety that really does make it very, very special here on campus. Um, but people come in with these um, ideas and you, our, our job is for them to leave with a physical um, representation of that idea. You know, what are they thought of? Can they leave out? Can they leave with a prototype in hand? And um, uh, they come in to learn the knowledge, but you know, we have online guides of how, you know, mostly safety. We do quick little tutorials on how to operate the machine. And then it's up to the user to learn the specifics of the machine. And, um, um, and usually uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, the users are highly, highly motivated to learn. And it's all in front of them. Um, uh, one of the, uh, it's a digital fabrication lab. So a lot of the tools are run by computer. And everyone who walks in the door has used a computer. So it's a, the barrier to entry is very low. Um, but then when you get into specifics of like, okay, how can this, uh, what are the capabilities of the machine um, or the program, um, that gets more complex. And then there comes, okay, how do you put these things together? So that's a totally new, uh, new area for a lot of, uh, a lot of people. Um, uh, it, but, uh, going back to leaving with a, uh, their product in hand, um, what's even more um, amazing is when they leave with something they hadn't thought of when they came in. I want to do this, but this, as they learn how to build that, the design evolves, and it evolves greatly, so it's almost unrecognizable from their first design. Um, and that's wonderful because that's, you know, they're, they're, they're not only just using the tools, they're learning. Um, I teach a class over at Jacobs called Design Innovation. Um, Actually, Jake, I say Jacobs, uh, usually called J Jacobs Hall, but the real name, the formal name is Jacobs Institute for Design Innovation. And um, that's a, I think that's kind of a high bar. But uh, um, it's wonderful class. Uh, it's an introductory class, uh, Design Innovation 22, um, Design Prototyping, Making Things. Is that the correct title? Um, <laughs> and um, and it's, it's open to everyone, so it's kind of like the Invention Lab. And we learn by doing. It's once again, it's uh, drawn from that material processes class, which is drawn from these classes. And um, in the class, it's a series of steps to uh, teach how to use all these digital fabrication uh, uh, machines or tools, and how to prototype, how to make 3D or physical objects from those. And uh, the class is very. Um, the assignments are structured um, very loosely, kind of like. A, kind of like the ArtBot classes where, you know, the first assignment is origami. And, um, uh, uh, and they bring in three pieces of origami. And in that lecture, we learn how to hook up a little ar a microcontroller, Arduino, and a servo to make it move. And they go home and they have to combine the two. And I'm always amazed at what they come back with. And there's a huge, there's usually a spectrum of the, of the assignments, um, depending on, um, uh, individual, you know, experiences of what their um, and materials they have access to, but uh, several of these projects look like they belong in a museum because there's a beautiful, nicely crafted origami shape, and when you approach it or when a button is hit, it transforms a little bit, and um, it's uh, uh, magical. A lot of these uh, uh, seeing these things in operation. And um, the next assignment is a drawing machine as a midterm project. Um, let me see if my slides are out of order here. Um, here's a drawing machine. Nope, there it is. Um, and the drawing machine is, this, uh, the definition of drawing machine is a mechanism that leaves a mark on a, on a surface. That's it. The rest of it is up to them. Um, I did have to add, um, 
no fire. So mechanism leaves a mark on a surface without using fire. Um, 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 what's he, what, what is it with the ME students and fire? I don't understand the fascination. Um, uh, this was amazing, this was amazing thing. Uh, this little uh, belt would go around carrying paper and these pins would kind of go up and down and dance all in a, in a magical wave going around. Um, uh, and the drawing would get quite complex as it went um, more and more. Uh, but that was, you know, uh, a lot of students would ask me, uh, we need a little bit more information. And I'm like, what do you want to see? I'm like, show me something I haven't seen before. And then they'd roll their eyes. And, uh, and I'm like, it's, you know, how much, uh, how much time do you have? You know, that's your biggest constraint, is how much time do you have? And, um, um, and uh, as long as it was fulfilled those requirements, it was fine. And so we'd get small drawing machines. We'd get huge ones that hung from the ceiling and that you had to give a plenty of room while they were in operation. Um, um, but it's, it's quite wonderful to see what the students come back. And a lot of the students are non-engineering majors, which adds, which is like the invention lab, adds a lot of variety to it, a lot of diversity and new ideas. And um, a lot of the times, uh, some of the most amazing projects in the class are from the non-engineering majors. And you know, their, their, um, um, their feedback is, I've never had a class like this, and I never knew I could learn all this and, and make something like this. And as a product designer and as an educator, that amazes me that they haven't been exposed to anything like this before, um, either you know, at, at home or in school. And, um, and it's wonderful. I have um, juniors and seniors taking the class when it's entry level class because they haven't had anything in their curriculum um, before this class was introduced uh, to provide this type of learning. Uh, the final project, uh, let's see if we can go back a little bit is a um, Bluetooth controlled vehicle um, where they have to basically, um, the, the vehicle is a mechanism that transverses a surface and that's it. Um, sometimes I had requirements like it can't have wheels um, to make it a little bit more difficult. And it does, there's obstacle course and this is one of the highlights of, um, it's a highlight for me of uh, usually the design showcase held at Jacobs is when the vehicles for the final they have to transverse this obstacle course under Bluetooth control from the phone. And uh, uh, these are two students. Um, um, and um, I'm trying to remember their majors. Environmental economics and COGSI. And so never built anything. And um, uh, this was one of the top vehicles in the class. And um, this is so cute. It's a little bit, it grew a little bit in size. Um, but it, it was a very, very uh, amazing vehicle because it worked really well with the dual treads. And it, was uh, very cute. Its eyes changed color depending on the function it was performing, left, right, straight, back, whatever. And so it was a very, it was an audience pleaser, crowd pleaser. And they went from, in one semester, they went from knowing nothing about electronics, mechanisms, 3D printing, laser cutting, to having something that it looks like you could buy off the shelf. And they got so much feedback, they're like, yeah, we want to make this a product. And then they thought about, what does that take? Oh wait, my class load next semester. Uh, okay, that's gonna, <laughs> I wanna graduate. I don't want a company. Um, so, um, uh, but there was a, 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 a huge, uh, it was a huge success, very successful. Um, let's go on. There's, a, um, this is, I think this was their first prototype. So that was their quick, their, their first iteration there. So you can see how it went from a box and trying to figure out the wheel layment, wheel, wheel, um, wheel um, arrangement. Um, here, um, here up here, this is a uh, walking mechanism. So we'd, we'd have a lot of, well, like, this should be called an inchworm. It's more like an inchworm mechanism. Um, uh, we have a, a crawler here. Um, one thing in the class uh, as a requirement, um, I'm usually, I, I usually require, as the number one requirement, must cause wonderment or have humor. And that gets, the main goal of that is to get the engineering and the non-engineer students to quit thinking about function, quit thinking about the most elegant gear train or the way it's done. You know, in the drawing machine, every class there's at least two groups that do an XY plotter. And I'm like, uh, 
I've, that's been done before. Show me, you know, how can you change this? And, um, um, and they turn on a side, and I'm like, oh, no, no. And, um, uh, but it's a good start. And um, so they, they, start, um, they start challenging themselves with, you know, I'm like, look at theirs, you know, look at, the, look at your classmates. What are they, you know, why is it on the ceiling? Why is it on the wall? Um, and some are tiny, um, some you have to really pay attention to, to see the, and others are, 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 are huge. Um, um, and, uh, excuse me, <laughs> backing up. Um, uh, in each step, of the, each step of the way, you can see the, the students learning and, and taking in this information and um, applying it to their next project. Uh, I get good feedback from uh, uh, students who go on to other classes. There's, um, there's many more hands-on classes at Jacobs, and uh, they, I get a, a feedback coming in of, about how they've transferred what they've done in their classes. I've had students come back with their projects that they've continued working on after, the, you know, after they turned it in. They'll show the improvements or show, show how they've taken it or they'll bring it back in the invention lab to repair it to get it going again, uh, way after the class is over. Um, and what's, uh, what's wonderful about uh, keeping the assignments so open-ended, once again, it's less work for me. I don't have to spec everything out. I don't have to answer you any questions about why, why, why. I can let the students, um, uh, uh, students lead their projects and just step out of the way. And, uh, and I, you know, I do get, you know, I do get credit for the classes and I'm like, I'm not doing any work. It's the students who are doing all the work. Um, and, um, and that's um, basically, that's what I'd like to end with is, uh, is amazing work that the students do when given the opportunity. So, thank you. Thank you. All right, great. We have time for some questions. Um, I'll ask one. Great. Oh, right there, oh, great. Oh. Yes. Fascinating, thank you. Um, have has there been any attempt, or have you envisioned um, broadening the scope of the class to talk about life cycle of materials? Life cycle of materials. Um, I hit upon a lot of, I throw in a lot of um, um, product design information into the class, but it's more as the subject comes up and you know, I'll answer questions or show them where to find the answer or do a little, you know, exploration on the internet. Um, but we do talk of, you know, you know, I, I will speak about design for manufacturing, design for disassembly, you know, total life cycle costs, you know, environmental impact, things like that. And, um, but those are more uh, loosely applied to the class, not in a systematic way, so. All right, I have a question, I don't know if I, uh, you've obviously had success with this course and others that you talked about that's kind of been the genesis of growing this. I'm curious if you would reflect on what is really needed, like what course or courses or skills are missing from the kind of curriculum? If, I mean, imagine you have infinite time, you have resources, what would you love to see in a pedagogy, you know, here at Berkeley or for students that's, to experience? Um, more classes like this, and not just based on, you know, I've, you know, the goal of my class is to learn the digital fabrication techniques and to learn iterative prototyping. But there's other ways of making things and there's other ways of, of um, creating things. I'd like to see more classes like this and other, a little bit more spread out uh, in the technology. Um, the, you know, this is entry level class and so it's, um, uh, it's always full, always a big waiting list and then there's usually upperclassmen in it. Um, I have graduate students asked to be in it, and so I definitely think there needs to be more types and more uh, of this class, uh, more sessions of it, or more uh, you know, related classes. So. Feels good. Yeah. Have you had a graduate go from the Invention Lab to the Foundry yet? Has somebody gone to the startup? Oh yeah, Taking yeah. a startup leap? Um, I mean, um, um, there's a, a lot, um, you know, one, uh, my, my favorite example is Adam, who came into the lab to take a class, 
and he's a rhetoric major, and um, he learned how to use the 3D printer, 3D cutter, three, uh, laser cutter, and uh, we don't have a 3D laser cutter yet, but I want one. Um, uh, uh, and he start, he's like, oh, this is how you create things, and he just went crazy creating things for his home. He, uh, he's really into uh, um, uh, designing for universal design, um, enable uh, design, uh, and so he's always prototyping something for, um, um, uh, he's part of Enable Tech, and uh, you can't stop the guy from making things. And he had, uh, in the class, he had one of the most engaging projects. Uh, they were doing wearable tech, and uh, his team made a project for um, uh, kids with autism or somewhere on the spectrum. So when they, there's this little furry creature they could wear, or put on their backpack, so it wasn't a watch or a Fitbit or this tracker or something. Here they, they made this little companion, and when it detected an outburst from the kid, um, from the child, it would actually start shaking and squeaking and curl up into a ball, this little furry ball. And to get it to stop, the kid had to engage it and pet it and stroke and talk softly to it. And, and as it was calming it down, it would calm themselves down. And, um, and that was an amazing project. It was like, Everyone else, everyone else in the class was doing like, well, this is what wearable technology is, and there was that's kind of a generalization. There was a kind of a spectrum, but it was a good example of how can you come into this area, wearable technology, from a totally different angle, and make something that uh, is very, I want to say, life changing for someone. And now he's involved in a startup, um, and he's the uh, CTO of the startup and the foundry, um, and doing wearable technology. Um, um, and so, and it's, uh, and they have a, they have a, their first contract they're trying to fulfill on, um, on some um, initial products. So, amazing success story. And he has a great, when asked, um, uh, when, when asked what um, rhetoric has to do with making, he has a, he, I think he has a video online um, where he talks about that. And it makes my mind hurt right now trying to remember it all, but it's a, he actually, you know, connects the two really, really well. So. Yeah, you, uh, you mentioned that you went to the first Maker Fair in 2005, and it sounds like you've been a regular uh, yes. attendee. Yeah. Um, have you, how do you think it's evolved over the last decade and uh, changed now? It's changed a lot. Every few years, you see a major shift in it. Um, it went incredibly commercial for a while, around 2000 and uh, let's say 12, um, 13. Um, a lot of corporate interest in it. Every, every company had to be there, you know, Cisco, Intel, I mean, everyone, you know, and um, that was a great thing. It's like, oh, they're taking this seriously. And, um, um, and now, um, actually, that was, uh, that, that had to be because 2008, the recession, uh, no, no, that was after the recession. So, and then there's been a little bit of, uh, okay, let's back off. Uh, there's some, been some core companies that have stayed there, and you actually see more products um, directed towards the maker or education, and that's been really good. Uh, but it's still really crowded. You can't see everything in one day, and um, yeah, and uh, wear sunscreen because a lot of it's outside. So I go to the, I've attended the New York, well, it's called the World Maker Fair in New York, um, and it's uh, in the um, um, say the Academy of Science, uh, but it's a much smaller venue, so you can see everything. It's much more intimate. And I like that one a lot, just because it's you can see everything in one day, and, um, and it's just as engaging. So, other questions? I'm gonna I, I'm gonna push you on uh, two things. Stop, yes, uh, there's two things that I think uh, are really insightful about your process and about how you kind of deconstruct things that you, that you didn't mention. Yeah. One of them is this, uh, where you basically collaborated with some others to make this miniature golf course in San Francisco, this urban putt, which maybe there's a little bit of a story that's interesting about that, that is about your design process and working for kind of this, this public space. But also, um, you do your own artwork too, and you just collaborated with some artists um, in Norway at an exhibition mm -hmm. with some robotic devices, so maybe uh, how that okay. differs from the, the interactions that you do in your regular teaching. Um, well, you know, as a product designer, you know, um, um, you know, this, uh, people ask me, how can I know enough about designing everything from medical to toys to, you know, working with Xerox PARC on emerging technology, and, you know, it's just problem solving. 
you know, it's the design process. All you have to do, do is know the design process and do that, those steps, and you apply that to anything. And, um, and when you get a project, you always say yes. <laughs> yes, I can do that. And then you become an instant expert. You do a deep dive into the technology, into the processes, or whatever that's needed for that project. And, um, and that applies to art or these, ma uh, these consumer projects, or even research projects. Uh, so it's a little bit the same. The art is amazing because it's much more, you're not working towards a monetary goal of like this has to be produced for this price and this amount and this amount of time. And then you do that and then you wait for the sales to come back whether you succeed it or not. Um, because you can have the best design project, product and if it doesn't sell, if, if it's, you know, it's out of your hand, way out of your hand, so a year later it's on the shelf and it bombs and it's still, I mean, that's still uh, a design failure in some respects. Um, uh, or something you think about, well, what could I have changed to make it successful? Um, in the art, it's, you know, you don't have to worry about all that. You still have a, you know, budget and you still have a timetable, um, but there's no, not, not that uh, pressure of the after the design is, is, is done. Um, and it's a lot more creative and a lot more, um, I'd say a lot more creative. That's not true. Uh, um, in the art projects, it's uh, easier to make these discoveries um, and adapt them. In design, you're on a special thing, and then you do learn things, you do discover things, um, but it's not always able to put, to put that back into the design. You don't have the time, uh, you don't have the material. Something is off to allow you to um, uh, evolve the design into what you just learned. Um, but in art, there's usually a way of doing it, and so the project you know, grows exponentially, and it's much more um, uh, this project in Norway it was a robot that traveled through a gallery projecting these amazing images that were made here at uh, UC Berkeley, some of the, um, micro the electron microscope and the laser microscope labs. Um, and so it was taking these tiny little images and blowing up super size on the walls. And you know, I worked on it for you know, half a, you know, six months. And, but to see it in place, um, it was just so amazing that some of you know, the parts was, uh, um, the end result was greater than some of the parts. Um, it was quite amazing. And that was, you know, in product design, you know how, all along, you know pretty well how, what, this, what the product is doing and how is it doing it and what level is it's at. But in, in a lot of the art projects, it's that end, you're like, oh, this is, you know, you step back and you're, you're, you're amazed. So. All right. Great. Uh, I want to thank Chris Myers again for a great presentation. And you should also, I'm encouraging you a little bit of sales pitch to go encounter him in one of his natural habitats of the Invention Lab, which uh, is 141 uh, downstairs. You want to add? Yeah, no, no, not the, the Urban Putt in San Francisco. Yes, on the corner at the of 22nd Van Ness. Yes. So it's a mini golf course, restaurant, and bar. You can have a fun day there. Who's been to Urban Putt? Anyone? All right. So, and, um, and that was a fun project. I mean, I can say I now I can put on my resume, mini golf designer. So, so. Uh, yeah, often students encounter it and then they don't realize that Chris was behind a lot of the designs. And I think we've all been to these miniature golf courses and they have that kind of very rote way of kind of interacting. And I, I guarantee you will be very surprised and full of wonderment if you go to this. So thank you, Chris, again for a great time. Thank you.